Welcome to the latest of the series of State Senator Bill Dodd's virtual town halls. Tonight's event is presented in partnership with KSVY 91.3 FM in Sonoma and Sonoma TV. Tonight, Senator Dodd is joined by two distinguished panelists who will be discussing the current issues and the year ahead in both California and the nation. I'm Rick Wynn, one of the volunteer hosts at KSVY 91.3 in Sonoma. This evening's town hall is being presented on multiple video platforms, including Senator Dodd's Facebook page, facebook.com slash sendbilldodd, sdo3.senate.gov.ca, Sonoma TV, Comcast Channel 27 in the Sonoma Valley, sonomatv.org, and the Sonoma TV channel on YouTube. For audio only, tune in to KSVY 91.3 FM in Sonoma or stream on KSVY.org or on your home smart device. Again, tonight we will be discussing current issues and the year ahead in both California and the nation. Senator Bill Dodd and the panelists will take your questions beginning around 6.30. The studio call-in number is 707-933-9133. That's 707-933-9133. We also have questions previously submitted by email, and we'll make every attempt to get those that are not addressed in the panelists' opening remarks and subsequent discussion. Senator Dodd represents all or part of six North Bay counties, including Napa, Sonoma, Solano, Contra Costa, Sacramento, and Yolo. And now I'll turn it over to Senator Dodd, who will make this e opening remarks and introduce this evening's panel. Good evening, Senator. Good evening, Rick, and thank you once again for being our host. I want to thank our panelists for taking time. Let's make note of this. They are three hours ahead of us here in, in California. So uh, it's 9 p.m. I cannot believe you guys are doing this for me. Thank you so very much. And you're also doing it for respective constituents as well. But thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd also like to thank KSDY for convening this. This is our 25th uh, monthly virtual town hall since 2020. Uh, tonight, we'll give an overview of the year ahead in California for the legislature and Congress. Uh, after, we will open the floor to your general questions. And I'm very glad to be joined by this distinguished group. And thanks to the hundreds of you out there that are joining us tonight by tuning in. Uh, later in the town hall, we'll be re reading the emailed questions. You can start making your calls at 6.30 p.m. The call-in number is 707 933-9133. I want to start by saying Happy New Year uh, 2024 to everyone. I think maybe this is as close as you can be to the last time that you can really say that. But I hope you're off to a great start uh, to 2024. This year is with great promise and significant challenges. It's an election year with the primary coming up in March, so get out and vote. Making your voice heard is essential to preserving our democracy and protecting your rights. In California, we're making headway on building our economy, creating uh, more affordable housing, and addressing homelessness. We're also pursuing our goals of reducing our carbon footprint while protecting communities and forests from wildfire. This year in the legislature, I've already induced, introduced a number of proposals to make our state better for all. I have bills to help address traffic, preserve uh, parkland, combat sexual assault, improve public safety, and set safeguards for artificial intelligence. This emerging technology will absolutely reshape our world in so many great ways, but we must take great pains to harness the good it offers while protecting against the bad. And I'll be working to support legislation to continue addressing housing, the housing and homeless crisis. Because of a reduction in revenues, the state is facing at least a $38 billion budget deficit this year. Now, we have enough money to pay for essential services like education and public safety. And I, I just really believe that those are two areas. But we cannot afford to allow our public uh, education system to suffer during this uh you know, during during this time, uh, we but we must be careful about many other expenses as well. And just like your family, we need to be frugal and make responsible choices this year that fit our budget. So there could be some belt tightening. Let me just tell you, there will be belt tightening in Sacramento, but that's something that you elected me to do and you elected my colleagues to do. 
But I do believe there's much reason for hope and optimism. Finances are improving, and the governor has proposed a balanced budget, which mostly gets us to where we need to be. But I look forward to the year ahead, and I'm ready to get down to work. Here tonight are two absolutely incredible guests to talk about what's ahead in 2024. Senator LaFonza Butler was appointed by the governor last year to fill the seat of the late, great Diane Feinstein. She began her career as a union organizer, became president of California SEIU, and served as a UC regent. She was president of Emily's List from 21 to 23. She was the first LGBT African-American to serve in our U.S. Senate. And I just want to make clear that so people know, uh, Senator uh, Butler has uh, an absolute stop time of 630, 6.30 hour time uh, for important commitments that she has at the Capitol. They work late. Senator Butler will have to leave the town hall, as I said, at 630. We very much uh, appreciate her time and we'll let her speak after I introduce our next guest, which is none other than my longtime friend, John Garamendi. John has a history of public service. Before being elected to the Congress in 2009, he served in both houses of the California State Legislature, was the California's insurance commissioner, and served as President Clinton's Deputy Interior Secretary and spent two years as Lieutenant Governor. He started out in the 1960s in the Peace Corps. Congressman Garamendi is the author of the Bury Us the Snow Mountain National Monument Expansion Act, among many other proposals to help our region and help our nation. Now let's hear from Senator Butler. Welcome. Thank you so much. So much, Senator Dodd. Thank you for the incredible leadership. It's inc uh, just really exciting uh, that our state legislative leadership uh, are, is continuing to sort of use innovative ways to bring our community together and make sure uh, that Californians have direct access uh, to their legislative leaders, uh, both in the state and in Washington. I just am so inspired uh, by this platform and your utilization of it and, and everyone who helps to helps to make it work. And I want to just recognize um, Congressman Karamindi, who just has been an incredible friend uh, since I was appointed in all of anything that I called and, and wanted to learn more about. Um, he has been there to answer the call. And that's just a demonstration of the great elected leadership that is representing the 40 million Californians here in Washington I have um, been on the job and in the in the uh, seat uh, in the United States Senate for just over uh, 100 days uh, now, and it has been fast moving. To be asked to serve uh, the people of California uh, following the great Diane Feinstein is an honor that was that I could have never imagined. And in this short period of time, there has been I have been working sort of breakneck speed. Uh, to be the kind of representative that the people of California uh, have come accustomed to uh, in under Feinstein's leadership, um, but that they that they truly deserve uh, in what are, uh, as you notice, Senator Dodd, times of great opportunity uh, and times of great challenge. And it's the California voters who will help us grab, wrap our arms around both of those uh, opportunities as we uh, are fast pursuing um, the challenges and opportunities that are in front of us. Here in Washington, there are many, many things happening. Just um, tomorrow in the Senate Judiciary Committee, there will be a uh, full hearing uh, of the large uh, tech company CEOs, all call California home. And you know there's going to be some accountability and some engagement around those tech platforms and their uh, protecting um, California and America's children uh, on their on their platforms. There are going to be votes this week, hopefully, about uh, what it is that we need to be doing to continue to be the uh, opportunities uh, to take on the opportunity to meet the ch challenge of what is happening around the world in terms of our foreign affairs and Israel and, and Gaza, but also Ukraine. Uh, and the work of President Biden to really uh, help to keep America in its global leadership positioning 
uh, and uh, as well as addressing matters of of our border and borders border security. And so hopefully there's going to be some work uh, um, this week that will be uh, addressing some of those uh, challenges and helping to meet this moment where President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris uh, have been leading. Um, we are, are just uh, uh, less than a month away, actually a little bit over a month away from the next um, potential government shutdown deadlines. Um, and working with uh, our appropriators and our uh, on the Senate side committee, uh, Appropriations Committee being led uh, by Senator Patty Murray uh, and her incredible leadership amongst uh, across all of the working appropriations subcommittees to make sure that we have um, a strong piece uh, of work to be moved over, uh, hopefully in concert with the House to keep our government open and protecting uh, California families that, that are federal employees from, uh, from a shutdown. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all sort of top line and um, very important work. And, um, you know, I just got back from California uh, just late last night where I have been doing a tour across our state talking to young people in our state, young voters who uh, are really concerned and optimistic about their own future in the state of California. I've been to San Diego and, of course, Los Angeles. Just this weekend, I was in Fresno and San Francisco talking with young, young people about what's on their mind, high school students who were you know, finding their way to, in civic participation and trying to understand how government can work for them and what their role is uh, in advancing uh, a government that is responsive uh, to what their needs are, but also what their dreams are. Uh, and the beauty of, of traveling this state uh, and being here in Washington on their behalf is that we, as you said, Senator Dye, have both hope and challenge uh, in front of us. Uh, the, the challenges of today and how we choose to handle it is truly going to have to, is truly serves as the hope for young leaders and young Californians coming, uh, coming behind us. We all are in these positions of elected leadership to make sure that we are passing the baton to future generations of a stronger California, of a stronger United States, of a stronger uh, global community. Uh, and, and I know that we are committed to doing that as leaders and including those young voices, those young leaders across California uh, in the process and, and in these conversations and centering their, their voices and their experience really is um, how I want to use my time here in the, in the Senate as I work on behalf of of Californians. There's work that we've got to do to strengthen democracy and, and expand voting rights, uh, as well as protecting against fundament, uh, protecting fundamental constitutional rights, like access to abortion, like California did, voters did uh, in the ballot just this past November. We've got to make sure that we're creating economic opportunity for young farmers who, who want to to stay in the agricultural business and, and make sure that they have the resources and capital uh, to be able to pursue the careers that they uh, find great passion on. And there is um, just a real crisis in our um, mental health as a country and young people in particular. It's why uh, every conversation, it's an issue that's come up in every conversation I've had with young leaders in California um, they are uh, talking about their mental health. They want to make sure that they have access to the mental health uh, services that they need, both in school and outside of school. And there's so much that we are. I am excited about getting to work and rolling up my sleeves. Some would say that I'm uh, I'm just I'm just an appointed senator that's going to be here for a short time. Um, and I think that there's so much that uh, I am uh, can be doing in this short period of time that I'll be representing California um, to help to move the ball forward for whoever California votes to be their senator uh, this next this this November starting in in March. So a lot of work in front of us, a lot of work that we all are, are trying to do to move our state and our country forward. And I'm grateful to be here tonight. And I look forward to being able to be a part of the conversation for as long as I can. Thank you very much, Senator. You sound much like you've been around a lot longer than 100 days. I can <laughs> tell you that. And it's just so great having you back there representing all of us. Now it's my great opportunity to uh, bring up now uh, Congressman John Garamendi. Welcome, John. 
Senator, it's a pleasure to be with you, and particularly a Senator, to be with Senator Butler. Uh, we have not done a town hall together, this being our first. And frankly, I found your opening uh, comments, Senator, to be right on target. You covered a lot of ground uh, about the, what is happening here in Washington, about what the Senate is doing. Uh, over on the House side, things are a little different. On the House side, we're dealing with chaos. I like to call our Republican colleagues the chaos caucus. I think many of you have followed the uh, ins and outs of the uh, Congress over this last year. Uh, it's not been a particularly productive time. However, the issues that confront us and the opportunities that we have to confront those issues are right in our hands. We have an opportunity this year to really make sure that we actually put in place the extraordinary legislation that was passed during the first two years of the Biden administration. And not only did we put forth the American Rescue Plan, which brought America out of the pandemic in very, very good shape. Other countries around the world are in recession. The United States government and economy are going full blast ahead. We didn't have a recession coming out of the pandemic, in part because of the American Rescue Plan that stabilized the economy, that kept people in their jobs, that allowed businesses to continue to operate. That was followed by other extraordinary legislation, the largest infrastructure legislation ever in America's history. Every conceivable kind of infrastructure is now available to grow the foundation of the American economy. From electric power grids to highways to bridges, sanitation, water systems, you name it. The money will be there over the next decade to build that foundation for America's growth, particularly important for California, where a good portion of that money will find its way into developing that foundation of infrastructure. We'll repair our bridges, we'll repair our roads, we'll build new, and we'll build better. We also put together a major attack on climate change. Uh, this is what we call the Inflation Reduction Act. That legislation provides the largest amount of money ever by any country in this world to address climate change. So if you're interested in uh, green renewable power, the programs are there for the homeowners, for the communities, for the nonprofit organizations, the schools, literally for everybody in California to draw down that money and to build out those new renewable energy systems. So if you want a uh, solar power system, the government will help you pay for that. If you want to put in a, uh, a more econ uh, more uh, a new uh, enter uh, heating cooling system, that's also available to you. So these are things that you can take advantage of out there. And I know in our district, Senator God, that communities are doing this, that individuals and businesses are drawing upon that. And finally, we're going to continue doing what I've always said are the five major things to grow an economy and to grow a just economy in which everybody can participate. Education. Senator Dodd, thank you so very much for starting this discussion with that fundamental investment that must be made. The federal government will help, but this is largely a state responsibility. And I know the state of California wants to do that. Secondly, research. In the Inflation Reduction Act is the largest research budget ever in America's history. Most of that will go for pharmaceuticals to deal with our healthcare issues, as well as for the renewable energy systems that we need to put in place. And also, we will begin bringing back to America, make it in America. This is the industrial, the program to rebuild the American industry, something I've been working on since my very first day in Congress in 2009 and my first day in the California Assembly more decades ago than any of us would like to think about. Make it in America. Make it in America. And that's in all of this legislation. So the money, uh, so the solar panels that you want to build, they're going to be American made. Uh, the trains, the, the uh, transit systems, the buses made in America. 
So that's the industrial policy that's now in place. And finally, international. Herein lies an enormous challenge for America. We have to deal with uh, Putin's invasion and determination to dominate uh, Eastern Europe by invading Ukraine and, in his view, subjugating Ukraine and rebuilding it back into what he considers to be the Russian Empire. Have to deal with that. Unfortunately, the funding for Ukraine is held up. Today, I've had two classified hearings on this, and we absolutely have to get this together. No help from the Congress. Republicans are going nowhere with this. But Senator um, Butler, we're counting on the Senate here. You've put together a compromise over there dealing with the second big international issue, which is our immigration policies. Get it done, move it over to the House, and force the Chaos Caucus to put the bill on the floor so that we can deal with the immigration as well as with funding Ukraine. Uh, these are the international issues that confront us on the Armed Services Committee. I'm in these every day trying to figure out the best policies for America. With that, Senator, I think we'll go uh, perhaps to your Q&A. Uh, you said uh, something like halfway through the hour, so I'll leave it to you. Senator Butler, I'm going to miss you on the last half of that. I understand what committee hearings will do to even a senator's late evening. You're going to have a lot of work to do tonight. Yeah, indeed. Okay, Rick. Senator Butler, uh, we have to excuse you. Thank you very much for being with us uh, for this short time. Uh, appreciate seeing you and your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Rick and uh, Senator Dodd. If there's you call on us when we when you need us to be in uh, in line, and we'll get there. Thank you so right. much for having me. Thank you, Senator Butler. Appreciate your time tonight. Of course. Take care, Senator. So we do have a few questions that have been uh, submitted by um, your constituents here. In uh, as when we sent out the promotional material, we asked for questions. Uh, the first question is uh, one that we've received a lot of questions on. And it's about what the U.S. should do regarding the Gaza situation. Now, I know that that's not so much in your bailiwick, uh, Senator Dodd, but it, it is in yours, uh, Congressman Garamondi. So if you could uh, give us some brief, both give us some brief comments on uh, what you think, uh, what what should be done there. Uh, Senator Dodd, uh, was that an invitation for me to go first? Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do that. As I said uh, in my opening remarks, uh, I participated in two classified hearings today on this issue. Uh, there is no doubt that Israel was attacked in the most horrible way. And Israel has the right and frankly the obligation to protect itself, to fight back. And they did so by initiating an a, a war in Gaza against Hamas. Uh, that was something they had the right to do and frankly the obligation to protect themselves. However, the conduct of that war has led to extraordinary loss of civilian life. And frankly, I think the uh, Israelis conducted the war in a way that they should not have done so. Aerial bombardments, uh, often with uh, missiles and uh, bombs that were not smart bombs in which the specific location uh, for the bombardment would be known. Uh, that simply has to stop. And my recommendation is that there be a ceasefire uh, to deal with the hostage situation, to deal with the humanitarian situation that has uh, developed in that country, uh, in that Gaza area, and then following that ceasefire, build in the West Bank and Gaza a new government so that we actually have two states, the state of Israel and the state of Palestine, that that be done in such a way as to preclude and to not allow Hamas and any other terrorist organization to regain power in either the West Bank or in, the, uh, in Gaza. But right now it's time for a ceasefire. It's time to uh, take care of the, uh, uh, the situation of the refugees that are within Gaza and to provide the humanitarian aid 
to um, deal with the hostage situation. All of them should be returned immediately. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, it can be done. The good news is that negotiations are underway uh, earlier today in Paris and are scheduled to reconvene tomorrow, which for Paris is, well, it's actually tomorrow in Paris. So hopefully those negotiations will bear fruit and there will be a ceasefire. Senator Dodd, do you have any comments? Yeah, you know, Rick, as you said, as a California senator, I don't really have a direct role in international affairs. But certainly as a human being, I support a quick uh, end to the hostilities and obviously some lasting peace in, you know, in that region. And I heard John's words there, and uh, I would tend to agree with, uh, you know, what, you know, his, his assessment is, you know, based on, his word, he's in these committee hearings, and uh, I think that's a plan that uh, hopefully will work going forward. Okay. Well, we're gonna we've got callers uh, on the line, so we're gonna we're gonna jump into callers just a little bit early, and in something completely different. Uh, Valerie's on the line to talk about uh, the Forever City in uh, in Solano. She's from Vacaville. Interesting topic, Valerie. Your question. Hello, Valerie. You're on the line, Mr. Valerie. Go ahead. Hey, Mr. Hello, Garamendi. Hello. I voted. Mr. Garamendi, my name is Warren. I'm from Woodland, California. I voted for you because at the time I, I, I like your values. And uh, I run a family-owned construction business. Recently, we've had to lay off eight employees. I saw it coming about a year ago, and I took steps to get ahead of the downturn. I went through the SBA, took advantage of counselors, completed the business plan, and revamped our website. The fact of the matter is people aren't spending money the way they used to. There is a recession moment. How are you going to handle the downturn in the economy? I think that question may have been addressed to, to me, but Senator, it's also a state issue. Actually, the, uh, the economy is very uneven. There are many... Uh, parts of the economy, and perhaps you're part of this, that uh, has not seen a return to economic growth and the opportunities that come with it. However, the general economy, when you look at the uh, macroeconomics, that is the large picture, has been extraordinarily robust. 14 million jobs have been created in the last uh, two years. However, it's uneven. And there are many communities and many individuals and businesses that have not been able to uh, participate in that growth. Our challenge uh, is to uh, take advantage of the legislation that I discussed earlier and some additional legislation that I didn't get to, to use that to spread the economic growth and opportunities broadly across all of America. Uh, particularly for the middle income and the low income uh, families and businesses in the United States. It is possible to do that and taking advantage of the, uh, of the current growth. It was anticipated that coming out of the uh, pandemic and the inflation, that there would be a recession. That has not occurred. And it appears now that we will probably not have a recession. Now, that means the economy will grow, but that doesn't mean that the economy, that that economic growth will be spread across all parts. So our task is to find ways to do that, and some of them are available. Some of the government programs that I talked about a moment ago, dealing specifically with uh, uh, the uh, renewable energy, these are opportunities for small businesses. The other opportunities lie in the infrastructure programs. Uh, and in the job training programs that are also part of these pieces of legislation. Uh, in the infrastructure, one of the things that has been very much on my mind, I know Senator Dodd and I have talked about this, is how to make sure that those contracts for those infrastructure programs, whether it's a sanitation system, water, or whatever, that those opportunities for those contracts are not 
only for the big international or national contractors, but also for the small local contractors. This is something that Senator Dodd and I've worked on specifically with Travis Air Force Base, which has seen a, about a half a billion dollars in new construction over the last two years uh, at that base. And I must say that we've not been as successful as I think we ought to be on bringing onto the base local contractors with local hires. So I'm going to let it go at that, Senator Dodd, if you want to add uh, on, uh, have at it. Yeah, well, I think uh, you you really hit the uh, you know the high points of that. For uh, this caller who's a contractor, uh, I know a lot of other contractors, home builders, for example, throughout you know, this, this district three that, uh, you know, are slow and have had to lay off, lay off employees. You know, I, I know our governor is really working hard as is the legislature to increase housing in the communities we serve. And I know that there's a backlog of those. And a lot, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, it, it, this is not a criticism of our local cities or counties, but they've got to start getting these permits out. Uh, what, what, you know, when these are approved, uh, and we're going to get a lot more. But to your point, really, uh, it's hard for a lot of businesses and people that want to you know, build housing. Normally, that's done with debt, at least for some period of time until the transactions are done. And with this higher interest rates that we have right now because of the Fed and what they've done. But we got to remember, they've done it for good reason. And I really do believe that I mean, it's it's the... There's the good and you know and the bad. The good that's coming out of this is by the Fed holding off on lowering interest rates, it has prevented us from going into that uh, re recession. So ultimately, I think there, we're going to start seeing uh, probably not at the end of this quarter, but perhaps at the end of the next quarter and what I'm reading that uh, we can start seeing some uh, reductions in interest rates and start seeing some uh uh, other uh, sectors of our economy improve. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to go to Valerie. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was, we had a little mix up there. Valerie on line two wants to talk about the California Forever City in Solano County. Valerie, you're on. Valerie, line two. We just can't seem to get Valerie on. Okay, let's, um, while we're trying to find Valerie, uh, as Senator Dodd mentioned earlier, the state anticipates a $38 billion budget shortfall this year. How, how did that happen? These are questions from our listeners. How did that happen and how will this affect essential services and how's the state gonna deal with this large budget gap? Well, how it happens is, is we've, we've just had a lot of this is timing. When the federal government uh, uh, delayed payment for good reason on uh, you know taxes to uh, November or December, uh, the state thought it was very important that we follow suit and give uh, our citizens the same uh, benefits of waiting to have their tax uh, you know payments come in. So it's a uh, so, so some of it is a cash flow problem. Others, frankly, is. Uh, a problem somewhat of our own making. Nobody likes to admit fault, but I, you know, we had a group of uh, moderate Democrats in the legislature that were calling on more one-time spending. And when you have uh, huge surpluses, you don't spend it on ongoing. I have no problems with the policy reasons that uh, that money wanted to be spent. I think we did some incredibly good things for the people of the state of California. But I think those days you know, those days are numbered. We've got to really, uh, uh, you know, work hard. I think our governors come out with an initial initial salvo on the budget that the legislature will be responding to in, in, in due time. And there'll be a May revise where the governor will, after all these conversations with our budget teams, uh, and then take a look and at the projections, where we are in real time, where we are, what they assume the, the, the budget, uh, uh, you know, growth will be. One of the other things is, is when you don't have a lot of IPOs, initial public offerings, you don't have a lot of, uh, you know, high-flying stock market where people are selling off. Right now, 
Uh, that's really not the case. Our stock market and economy seems like it's revving up. Uh, but, you know, from this point on, we'll see that next year, not in this, in, you know, in this fiscal year. So we just haven't gotten the capital gains, revenues, and we're not projecting those like we've had in previous years. And then, of course, uh, you know, there was a lot of COVID money that came in as well, and we put that to good use. But, uh, you know, now it's it, it, now it's a matter of getting real. And like I said earlier, um, the education, our public education system, from kindergarten all the way through our UC systems, CSU, community colleges, all included, we've got to hold them steady. And we've done such a great job, in my mind, over the last 10 years, making sure those budget numbers have grown in the right direction, and they have. And the last thing we want to have them have to do is retool, or the last thing we want is increase tuitions uh, for our college students. So uh, this is a work in progress, but uh, I think we've got we've met the moment. We've also saved a lot of money. Our rainy day fund that was started by Governor Brown uh, is in good stead, and we feel like it's it, it's really going to be a matter of where we take that money and plug holes and being mindful that we don't want to blow it all in one year because the uh, regret the projections are this is a two to three year problem. Um, I think we're going to get to California forever now. Uh, <laughs> Valerie Valerie has left us, but David of Fairfield is on line one, and he'd like to talk Before about the last one is increased tuition uh, for our college students. David, so, uh, David, David turn off your radio. Uh, radio. David, turn off your radio. We've also saved a lot of money. Our rainy day fund that was started by Governor David, Brown. turn off your radio. Uh, it's been good set, and we feel. David, are you there, David? Well, I, I'm going to ask the question. What do, you, what do you gentlemen think of California forever in Solano County? Would you like me to go or do you want to go? I think we're of the same mind. Why don't you go? Why don't you start, Senator Dodd? Yeah, you know, I... I have been hearing from my constituents because this is all in district in Senate District Three, and I've been hearing a lot from our uh, my constituents, county supervisors, uh, the tax assessor over there about all these properties that have been been bought up over I don't know the last year or two, and uh, you know I, I have not been uh, silent on the fact that I just believe that this forever. Uh, you know, California is, uh, uh, it boggles my mind that anybody would start out it with, using a process like they, like they use. It was disingenuous. It hurt people. It caused a lot of worry. Uh, then they came back and bought a lot of properties and started suing farmers. And so it was just fraught with issues. And then the more they bring out their plan, They've got hired guns now, which is, look, at this is all their right, uh, you know, to be able to do. But at the end of, at the end of the day, the voters of Solano County are going to be asked to vote on a proposition with no environmental impact report, no real significant technical reports on what the issues are with water, with sewer, uh, with other infrastructures, our road and street infrastructure. There's an intersection of two highways that come right into that development. And I could go on and on and on. And it really makes me worried in many, many ways that the issue really isn't about this utopian city, but there may be some underlying issue uh, that they're looking for that uh, is of yet uh, to be disclosed to the public. Congressman Garrett. Well, I'll take it from there, Senator. <laughs> I Flannering Associates is not to be trusted. For five years, I've represented uh, Travis Air Force Base and some of the very first property that was purchased by Flannery Associates was around Travis Air Force Base. And they would, we could not find out who was buying the property, where the money was coming from. And we knew at that time that there was Chinese money that was buying around another critical Air Force base in North Dakota. And we had great concern. 
that perhaps this would this purchase of this land would somehow harm a fundamental national security asset, Travis Air Force Base. We actually had to go to the Treasury Department after five years of trying, four years of trying to find out what in the world is going on as more and more land was being purchased. We finally went to what, an organization called CFIS, uh, which is a foreign investment uh, review. We asked the FBI and the Treasury Department, what is going on here? They began an investigation. And then at that point, Flaherty Associates came forward and said, oh, not to worry. This is all about a bunch of uh, Silicon Valley billionaires that want to build a new city. We go, a new city? Where? Between Fairfield and Rio Vista. Are you kidding me? You're going to build a new city underneath the windmills? You're going to build a new city over abandoned oil, uh, gas fields and endangered species? And you're going to build a new city along Highway 12 and Highway 113? Have you been over those roads? Do you have any idea what you're doing? Well, let me put it this way. They had perhaps the best real estate promoter I've ever come in contact with. Somebody that could get $800 million out of the pockets of the Silicon Valley billionaires deserves a lot of respect as a real estate promoter. But as a developer, no way, no how. For 35 years, three elections over three decades, the voters of Solano County have said orderly growth, no urban sprawl, orderly growth. We in Solano County will grow in our existing cities. That's where the growth will take place. We're going to have a green belt. We're not going to have urban sprawl from San Francisco all the way to Roseville. And they have voted three times over 30 some years to do that. And now Flannery Associates comes up with a new name, California Forever, comes up with a bunch of uh, wonderful ideas that very much remind me of Walt Disney's Main Street in Anaheim, California. It's going to be a happy, wonderful place with all kinds of great things, probably including uh, Tinkerbell and uh, yeah, goofy, we know, is in place. It makes no sense whatsoever. Who's going to pay for this? Who's going to pay to upgrade Highway 12, which is already congested? And Highway 13 is a grade D rural road. Where's the water coming from? Senator, you're absolutely right. There's no water here. They're going to have to take water out of the Delta, or they're going to have to take water away from somebody to build a 400,000-person city. Give me a break. This is utter nonsense, and it will be a financial disaster for Solano County. They say, oh, not to worry. We'll protect Travis Air Force Base. Hey, I read the fine print, fellas. I read the fine print in your initiative. You said Travis is protected. Yes, from what? Well, not from development that is um, – supportive of the purposes of Travis Air Force Base. What could that be? Manufacturing? Possibly. Could that be uh, logistics? Possibly. But you look at all of the infrastructure that has to be made and you say, guys, this makes no sense. The voters of Solano County, I am confident, will see through this scam, this boondoggle, and they'll say, fellas, you made a bad investment. You made a bad investment here. You're not going to put houses underneath windmills. You're not going to build 400,000, a city of 400,000 people. Uh, and we're not about to pay for it. So, um, no. No to the initiative. Thank you, Congressman. Um, uh, we're going to switch gears entirely again. We have Sandy on line two. Sandy, be sure your radio's off. Uh, she's from Woodland, and she wants to uh, talk about the Barry S. Snow Mountain National Monument. Sandy? Sandy? We seem to be having technical difficulties tonight. Sandy, on line two, you're on. Okay. Um, we, can, we can talk about the Barry Ensign Snow Mountain. Sure. We 
Let's go. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. So I wanted to say thank you to Senator Dodd and Representative Garamendi for so much, so much, including your years of support for public lands and for Barry at the Snow Mountain National Monument, including adding Malek Loya to the monitor, monument. Representative Garamendi introduced the Barry at the Snow Mountain Expansion Act and hosted Interior Secretary Holland. That Malik Loyak, Senator Dodd, has a resolution in the California legislature to support this effort. I want to know what can we do as members of the public to get this over the line and protect Malik Loyak? How can we support you? Senator, we can toss a coin. I know you're deeply engaged in this, uh, as am I. You want to take the first shot? Well, just that... Uh... Uh, you know, just like we did, we all worked as a team. Senator, uh, Congressman uh, Garamendi, Congressman Thompson, the, the Secretary back with uh, Barry S. Snow Mountain, uh, and, the, and all the advocates, probably you were one of them, uh, caller, uh, that uh, worked so hard getting the Barry S. Uh, uh, Snow Mountain or original executive order passed, of which. Uh, uh, I spent some time in the White House with Congressman Garamendi and President Obama signing that uh, uh, resolution. But I think from my vantage point, having letters committed to the committee consultants uh, for this resolution would be advantageous uh, so that the people, you know, a lot of these consultants are people that are really hardworking, but they may, they may not be all that aware of the you know, the benefits to uh, expanding uh, Barry S. Snow Mountain. So I'd encourage you uh, to do that from the state standpoint. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Sandy, you may want to turn off your, uh, just hang up and listen to the radio. You're getting feedback. Add away, Sandy. Rules of the game here. Make your call, then, then listen to the radio. Um, a couple of things here. Uh, Indeed, uh, Senator, I know that uh, you're deeply involved. The resolution from the California legislature will be very, very important. That will empower uh, the president uh, to move uh, the uh, expansion, which he can actually do, of the Berryessa Snow Mountain area. He has the power to expand it uh, under the Antiquities Act, which dates back to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's time. Uh, the other option is to move with the legislation that uh, I've introduced uh, together with Mike Thompson uh, in the Congress that would also lead to an expansion. However, the Congress of the United States is not a good place at the moment. Uh, the Republicans are in chaos. Uh, they're having trouble just maintaining a speakership, let alone trying to pass uh, any kind of uh, environmental legislation. So I think our best bet here is for the president, uh, as often happens in the last six months of a presidency, uh, for the president to uh, take advantage of the Antiquities Act and expand it. I'm not sure that all of the uh, people that are on this uh, town hall are aware of what this Berryessa Snow Mountain uh, area is. It's about 100 miles of the uh, coastal range of beginning all the far north at Snow Mountain, all the way down uh, past uh, the reservoir uh, in uh, Lake and uh, Napa County. Uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, there are species of flora and fauna that are found nowhere else in the world. Uh, much of it is undeveloped. Uh, there are homes. Uh, there are some ranches. All of those are protected in the, uh, in the area. Uh, the federal legislation, uh, and the expansion would be for a very unique part of that uh, extraordinary mountain range, which was left out in the original legislation uh, because of some potential for a wind farm uh, on the uh, high ridges in that area. It turns out that that wind farm is not viable. And uh, now this area should be added and protected permanently. So, yes, contact uh, uh, the legislature, Senator Dodd and his legislation. Uh, contact uh, the president uh, with letters and certainly you can contact my office. Uh, we will continue to push the legislation 
and we will work with the uh, president and the secretary of interior uh, who was gracious enough to spend an entire day touring the uh, major parts of the Berryessa Snow Mountain and the area that would be added uh, as a result of the legislation or the Antiquities Act. So Secretary Holland knows, uh, and we'll, we'll make this happen. We really will. It's very, very important. Thank you very much. We have about four or five minutes left. Um, I, a question that came in from listeners uh, or from uh, readers or anyway, a question that came in via email, it's kind of uh, short answers may be difficult, but I think we need to keep them short. Do you believe our democracy is broken or at risk? I'll let uh, Congressman Garamendi go first. Our democracy is as strong as we are willing to fight for it. This next election is a critical moment in that fight to preserve the democracy. I think Benjamin Franklin said it so very well. We have a republic if you're willing to keep it. And that requires us to do just that. This next election, um, excuse me, I'll be a bit political here. Former President Trump has made it very clear that on his first day in office, he intends to have a dictatorship and run it the way he wants to. I don't know of any dictatorship that ended in one day. However, he has also put forth an agenda that would basically terminate much of what we believe our, our democracy must be. And so we're going to have to fight fiercely for it. We're going to have to hold all of us who are running for public office to account. Are you willing to agree that there are free and fair elections and that the count selects the next president, or do we have an insurrection? So, uh, yes, if we fight for it, we'll have a democracy. If we don't, fight fiercely and pay attention to this next election. We could easily lose it. And there are plenty of examples of how that happened. Take a look at Germany. Take a look at how Hitler actually came to power. So I'll let it go at that. Senator Dodd, do you have a comment? Well, I agree with John, uh, excuse me, Congressman uh, Garamendi, uh, certainly. Uh, but I also uh, think it goes even deeper. It, de it really depends on how far uh, those congressmen and senators, particularly on the, the Republican side, uh, are, are willing to go. Uh, you know, they've clearly had forgotten, you know, what happened on January 6th or have just gotten convenient memories. Uh, th this is uh, an extreme danger. I think I, I just know so many Republicans, frankly, they're very, very close friends of mine. They get this. Uh, but at the same time, there are those out there. He's obviously got the strong support we've seen already from, uh, you know, the primaries. And I think it's just uh, uh, I just don't I, I hope that uh, if the situation were the same for me, that I wouldn't think my job is so important that I would speak truth to power and call it the way I see it, which was, you know, was an uprising. And there, there are those there that have done that. And I certainly think that they're very honorable, but it, it, it's not just one man. It, 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 it is a, a set of men and women that are willing to, to, to uh, cast a blind eye to what's going on. And that's not good, but I feel very, very strongly about our, our democracy and, uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, you know, our country has had some tough times in the past, and I, I do believe that we will stand up and we'll weather this storm. Those are encouraging words. Um, and our time is up. I apologize for the two callers who remain on the line, and I apologize for, to Valerie for never getting her on. But I think we covered her question very well uh, with regard to California forever. Uh, Senator Dodd. It's been a pleasure working with you again, and I'll let you close it out. Well, thank you very much, Rick. As, as always, you've done a great job. Uh, 2024 brings new opportunities and also, as we've heard tonight, new challenges. But together, uh, we can make it a better California for everyone, and that's what we're working on here in Sacramento. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. 
Uh, but we'll continue to uh, keep you posted of what's going on. I want to thank my friend, uh, Congressman Garamendi, for taking time out of your busy schedule late in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Congressman, for being here with us. Pleasure being with you, Bill. Thank you. And Rick, thanks again to you and KSBY for the wonderful work you do. My pleasure and our pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, good night, everybody. Good night.